So um, we will look at a real-world world example um, of a challenging data set. Um, I'll show you some of the uh, – we'll go into the software now, and uh, um, I'll show you how we set up a project. And we'll talk about this data set in a little bit more detail, which is an E. coli K-12 data set. And there were some quality issues at both the 3 prime and 5 prime ends. Um, and, and this was used, uh, assembled with Seekman Engine 4.0. And the problem that we saw with the data set is – um, the assembly stalled after 24 hours. It was still running. It should have been done, you know, overnight. Um, there was lots of RAM that was uh, being used, more than 16 gigs, when it should should not use more than about 8 gigs of RAM. And there was over 1,000 small contigs forming. And this, again, was using default uh, parameters. And taking a peek at the data, so again, one of the first things we'll do is just look inside the data file. And is there anything obvious in the data file that, uh, might be causing a problem. And so this is just a little screenshot of the data. And so there's two sequences here, and there's a TCAG tag that was left untrimmed in this data. So that's one minor problem. And then there was a three prime area of lower quality data that was not trimmed, and the quality scores were not recognized properly. They were in a different, uh, uh, different range that was not expected. And so that's something we see fairly common with different data sets where um, there may be some trimming issues. And so looking at the data oftentimes uh, allows us to correct these things. So how do we improve a de novo assembly that is running too long and there's some problems on the ends of the data? And so I'm gonna, we'll go in the software here, but here's uh, a couple things. We trim the five prime and three prime ends of the reads, increase quality score trimming, um, and then do some multi different assemblies to figure out what the best match percentages are, the best parameters, and then we confirm accuracy. So at this point, I'll jump out of our PowerPoint. Matt, while you're transitioning, uh, we do have one question. Uh, someone's working on whole genome sequencing using ion torrent data of Mycobacterium bovis, mm -hmm. and wondering how to select the best reference genome from those available on GenBank? Uh, that, that's actually a very good question. So um, when you have, a, a, say, a novel organism or one that maybe you don't know if there is a good reference sequence possible, uh, when, you, when you have a new strain that you're working with, uh, there's always the question, should I do a de novo assembly or should I do a reference-guided assembly? And uh, Oftentimes, there's no clear answer, so you, you really do both. I'm going to run a de novo assembly, look at my results, how many contigs do I have, how big are they, how many gaps do I need to close, and then I might search for the best possible reference sequence. Um, and that search can be difficult, but we do actually have a tool in Seekman Engine that makes the search a lot easier. Um, so, um, so I'll actually show you as I, I'll introduce the software here, and I'll answer the question at the same time. So um, I can show you the workflow here. Uh, Seekman Engine um, is our assembler of uh, next-gen sequence data. It's 64-bit. It runs on Mac, PC, and Linux. Um, it provides an interface that allows us to set up a variety of different projects. Uh, today we're talking about de novo assembly, but I'll show you um, if we're going to create a new project and click Next. It allows us to make these uh, choices to do different workflows. Um, to answer the question, if I don't know what my best reference sequence is, um, for a certain strain, um, Engine provides a metagenomic workflow that becomes a sorting algorithm. So as an example, if I'm doing the metagenomic, I can say, let's do a metagenomic templated assembly, and I'm just going to move ahead here to where I input my template files. At this point, I could enter all the known mycobacterium genomes. Um, as my templates, and then let Seekman Engine sort the data to the mycobacteria uh, genomes. And by looking at the results, we can see where which of the genomes most of my reads align. Uh, and the capacity for Engine is very, very large. It's designed for human genome assembly and multiple human exome. So I can have several thousand bacterial genomes to use as my template um, to, to identify what the best reference is. So that's just a, a, another workflow. Um, we aren't going to cover that uh, today, um, but that, great question because that's often one of the first questions you need to answer when you have a bacterial strain. Um, so let's go back to the first page. So this wizard has multiple pages. It allows me to set up a variety of different projects. It's a very unique um, aspect of Seekman Engine 
is that it can support multiple different types of workflows, um, and it can accommodate different, multiple different sequencing platforms. And so this wizard gives us the flexibility to do that. Whereas most open source programs are you know, specific to one type of data, one type of workflow, um, Engine can do many different things. Um, so we'll just create a new project here, uh, Genome Assembly. I'm just going to click Next, and we'll pick De Novo Assembly. And we can see that we have templated assemblies, and these produce a BAM file output where there's no real limit to the size of the projects. You know, we can have um, billions of reads in a BAM file, and it still behaves and performs quite well. Uh, we have De Novo projects, um, and these are, um, again, RAM limited for the assembly. Um, it can produce a completely editable output, um, so there is a limit to about around 10 to 15 million sequences in the project to be fully editable. Um, and then we also have an a intermediate workflow um, that is for using a reference genome to guide the assembly of your data. So if we go back to the mycobacterium example, maybe I find a possible reference that might be better than my de novo. And if I can use a reference genome, it can guide my assembly. And in many cases, um, uh, provide a shorter route to a complete genome or a completed uh, assembly of your strain than a de novo assembly. Um, this is actually going to change. We're going to have an update here a little bit later this fall um, that automates this process even further so it becomes a, a, a reference-guided genome assembly with gap closure workflow. Uh, we may have another webinar on that in a few months. Um, so de novo assembly, um, now I, I enter my name. We'll call, call this de novo genome. I pick an output folder. Uh, I'm going to save my project as a Seekman file. Um, this is a completely editable file. We also create a BAM output file. Um, at the moment, the BAM file is not editable, but it allows me to view much larger assemblies. So if I'm working with a eukaryotic genome, um, I can open the file, look at the contigs, look at the scaffolds um, in the BAM format. I can also save a variety of other um, output, including the unassembled reads, the contigs, and the report. Uh, the sequence files, um, I set my platform. Again, with Engine, uh, we can accommodate all different sequence types. So as I select the platform, in this case we'll pick ion torrent, um, that's where we really start to set the optimal default parameters. And so each read technology um, has its own unique properties in terms of error rates, and quality scores, and so our algorithm will flex a bit, use a different set of parameters for the different, uh, uh, different platforms that we're using. I, I've loaded some of the data in. Uh, we, we can handle both unpaired and paired reads. Um, the file formats are generally FASTQ or SFF for ion torrent. For Illumina, it's typically an Illumina FASTQ file. Uh, FASTA files can also work, um, but they lack quality scores. And paired data, um, again, for de novo assembly is very, very important if you want to order your contigs. I've loaded two different files, one with an insert size of 3,500, another with an insert size of 9,000. Um, and again, Seekman Engine will use this information to produce better contigs and allow us to um, order them. Um, now, we get into some read options. I can input the number, limit the number of input reads. A common problem that we'll run into, more so with Illumina data, is just having actually too much data. If, you have, if, if the particular lane was not multiplexed um, and you have all your data from a high-seq run for one microbe, you, know, you can very well have coverages in the tens of thousands across your genome. So um, it's important to target the coverage to know how much data you have and target a coverage of between about 50x and 250x coverage for your genome. Um, going above, certainly above 250x, um, will um, um, cause more RAM to be used, and you might run out of RAM trying to process those very, very deep de novo assemblies. So, so this option becomes very important if you've got massive amounts of data. There's, so as I mentioned in the PowerPoint, de novo assemblies are very much dependent on having really clean data um, to be assembled. And if there's anything affecting the ends of the sequences, that can have an adverse effect on assembly time and contig quality. And so Engine provides many different parameters here where we can do some trimming. Um, and I can, I can scan for adapters, repeat contaminant sequences. 
Um, and by default, we always do a quality end trim. And there's also some more trimming options here. And uh, the trimming options include the default quality end trim. And what this end trim is doing is it's looking at the ends of sequences in windows of five, and when that quality drops below 15, it will trim the end of the sequence. And so the defaults are to do kind of a minimal quality trimming, no fixed end trimming. Uh, we can also do a, what, what's called a trim to mer trim, which is quality score independent, and it looks for areas where the reads align to each other and match the consensus of the contig, and then trim back regions uh, that do not match. Um, so that's also a very good option when there's problems with the quality score. So we have lots of different things that we can do, including adjusting the vector repeat and contaminant scans and actually um, make some adjustments to those algorithms. Um, this particular data set, as, I, as we looked at in the PowerPoint, had some issues. It had, first of all, a little tag on the 5' prime end. We can trim that off the 5' prime trim. And through some assemblies that I did a while back, I learned that the longer reads were problematic, that we had some problems with quality scores from the base caller. And so I can do a 3' prime trim at 125 bases or maybe 150 bases so that I don't include data beyond 125 base pairs um, into the sequence. So these are just some options that I determined through a number of different assemblies to improve this particular data set. And trim to mer also is beneficial uh, for this particular data set. So these are some adjustments that you can make. Um, quality and trimming, I can make it more stringent by, by saying I really want a window of 20 and a quality score of 10. So by changing these values, I've increased the stringency. And, and again, those can be done with trial and error. And, and I'll show you a couple of tables where I did a few different parameters. The assembly is fast enough. We can get different results and, and, and again, um, make some changes from those default values to get really good assemblies. Um, here's some options now. Um, I enter in my estimated genome length. It doesn't have to be exact, just um, you know, within half an order of magnitude or so for the repeat handling. Um, Seekman Engine is a very stringent assembler. Um, it does identify repeats. It doesn't throw them out. Many assemblers just take repeats and toss them out and only assemble unique areas. Seekman Engine does try to place the repeats. Um, and there's only a handful of assemblers that can do that capably, and Engine is one of them. Um, the MER size and match percentage, these are the two uh, most important parameters. Uh, MER size, usually we don't change. It, it is the unit where you have to have a perfect match between the read and the de novo consensus in order for a read to lay out potentially to that location. Now, reads might match multiple locations in a de novo assembly. Um, so MER size is kind of is the initial um, qualifier for placement of a read. The match percentage then um, determines where the read will go uniquely in that assembly. And at a 90% match, that means the read must match the consensus of the contig 90% in order to align at that location. The minimum match is the single most important parameter. If I drop this to 80, it will have a significant impact on the assembly and it will uh, decrease the stringency. It might cause things like misjoins or chimeric contigs if it's too low. If I make it very high, say 99%, that allows for very little mismatch and will probably create many small, very small contigs um, if we hit the error rate of our sequencing technology, it really inhibits the assembly. I might use this, though, in things like a metagenomic de novo assembly, where I want to parse my reads into contigs that, are, um, that represent um, different species or different strains in a mixed sample. So this is a great parameter to first start with the default, but then go a little lower, go a little higher with your data set, see what gives you the best results. So once I've uh, set parameters, again, the wizard allows us to set up a wide variety of project types. Um, we stick with defaults. 90% of the time, we'll stick with the default and get a great result. If I have a problem, I may go back and do some trimming, like I, I showed you. And what's happening on the back end now is we have a, uh, a script that's generated. Uh, this script, you can see, we have a genome assembly. It's de novo. Uh, we have our parameters that we changed, um, and I won't go through all these details, but there are more parameters as well, 
And what this script file is, is it's the instruction for the assembler. If I'm an advanced user and I'm running many assemblies overnight or over the weekend, I can also take this script file and run the assembly from the command prompt. So a common example may be I want to change my match percentage to five different values, so I can copy and paste five scripts into one file and drop it into the command prompt. Um, I'm not a command line user myself, but I can, I can manage to do that without too much trouble. Um, most users, though, are just going to use the wizard here. When we click Assemble, um, you can see we have a log here that's streaming through. It just loaded the script in, and we can watch the progress of our de novo assembly. Um, I also usually have my task manager running. And what I'm watching for is I want to make sure there's a progression in my, in my log. And I also want to see how much RAM I'm using. And you can see this SNG, this is the de novo assembler. And I can watch here the RAM is ramping up. And I can see how much RAM I'm using for this particular assembly. So this is how I monitor a de novo assembly. If there's a problem, if I pin my RAM, um, then the assembly essentially is going to stall and probably not finish. So I'll just stop the assembly, figure out why I'm using so much RAM, maybe cut back on the data, and try my assembly again. So I can watch this uh, progress. Um, I can also save a log, send that to tech support if I have a problem. So I like to let my de novo assemblies run like this and kind of keep an eye on them as they progress. We won't wait for this one, though, so I'm going to stop it. And look at a completed assembly. Um, so when the assembly completes in Seekman Engine, uh, there will be a button that says, you know, save the file or launch Seekman Pro. So Seekman Engine is the assembler. Seekman Pro is uh, the analysis tool. So the idea is that you might have a more powerful computer with more RAM that you can run your assemblies on. But the output then, the Seekman file or the BAM file, uh, you can do that analysis of that project you know, using Seekman Pro, which is part of the LaserGene core suite. I can do this on a laptop or you know, my own um, um, desktop computer. I don't need the 64-bit high-powered computer to do my analysis. Now, if I'm closing a lot of genomes, I still probably want a pretty sturdy computer um, because these files can get quite large. Um, but you definitely do not need as powerful a, a computer. So, excuse me. If we look at the report, so when I when I open the file in Seekman Pro, two windows are open. One is the list of contigs or scaffolds. The other is the report file that tells me about my assembly. I can see what version I used. Version 401. It took about an hour and a half. Um, I can see how many contigs I'll need to get to my genome length. I've got 92 contigs I have to piece together. I can see that I assembled 5.5 million sequences in about about 10%, a little less than 10% did not assemble. So that's pretty typical. Um, sometimes I'll look at this number with the very best data sets that are cleaned up with long reads. This number can get as low as 20 to 30. Um, under 100 is generally uh, pretty good. If this number is 400, that means your contigs are pretty small, and you want to reassemble and try to optimize so that you have fewer gaps to close. Uh, contig in 50, 86,000. A little bit on the, on, the, on the smaller side for this data set, I would probably fiddle with some parameters and, and reassemble. So there's a lot of information here. I can see the lengths of my sequences. They are 72 base pairs on average. Those that didn't assemble were very short. So that explains the 515,000 that didn't assemble. They're short, 27 base pairs, and their quality was only 14. And so uh, when I'm helping customers, I have them send me this report file. This, this gives me lots of information that's helpful for troubleshooting. Um, the data now is in this window. Um, I actually did one step ahead of time. So, so this, this, this window actually has a list of contigs when you first open it. And what I did is I used the pair, an algorithm that reads the pair data and orders the contigs into scaffolds. And so that is under Project Order Contigs. It runs that algorithm, and it generates scaffolds. And so scaffolds now are a list of contigs, and these contigs have positional information. And so they're placed in the position according to the paired end data. And again, that's why it's, it's you know, if you want to put your genome together, it's absolutely critical to either have a good reference or good pair data um, to do that.
and so I can look at a scaffold. So the big advantage to Seekman is now I can um, open up a scaffold, and there's a whole lot of information going on with the scaffold. I'm going to uh, just zoom out a little bit here. So we can see at the top we've got Contig 227, Contig 155, Contig 790. And so at this scale, we're, seeing, we're not seeing the small Contig 1405, which is right here. So we're visualizing now this Contig list in a horizontal view. And we've got lots of uh, um, plots going on here. And what these plots are, depth of coverage. So you can see some of these Contigs have very deep coverage. And then there's some smaller Contigs in the middle that have less coverage. And the color coordination there is, is due to how much coverage we, we have. And let's make this a little smaller here. And so it allows me, so the strategy view then becomes a kind of a genome browser view where I can look at my contigs, visualize how they lay next to each other, see what the depths of coverages are. I can change this color coordination. Right now my deep areas are in red. My uh, typical expected areas are in green, and my thinner areas are in, are in blue. I also have a pair consistency. And the, these thick green areas mean that I have lots of pairs within, within the contig that are the expected distance apart. And I can look at those different reads using the key that's in the strategy view. And I'm showing just the green contigs where the mate pairs are pointing at each other within a contig, the expected distance apart. And so you can see all these reads and on this bottom view. And these are, if I zoom in enough, I'll get, I'll be able to see the arrows uh, pointing at each other, forward and reverse reads. And that's how we um, generate this plot. And so pair data can be used to assess the quality of contigs. It can also be used to um, order the contigs. So I'm just going to zoom out here a little bit. Um, and now if I change my key and say, instead of showing me reads that are within a contig, show me the reads that we use to put these contigs in this particular order. These are the blue arrows. And I'm going to go to this kind of zoomed out view. So I have a little contig here, and I have a big contig, 155. And you can see these blue arrows um, bridge the gaps between the contigs. So if you look real close, there's a gap here. There's a gap here at 45,000. These dark blue arrows then are showing me the actual reads then that span across that gap and allowed me to put the contigs in this particular order. So it's a very powerful um, visual tool to look at scaffolds and make confirmations on accuracy of contigs and also the order of these scaffolds. So Seekman gives me these great tools for this. Now there are additional things that I can do. Um, for instance, there's some more algorithms. Um, oftentimes, the gaps between these contigs are due to things like repetitive elements. Um, in E. coli, it's mostly IS elements. Of course, there's some phage that are inserted, maybe some ribosomal operons. Uh, and that oftentimes causes a contig to end at a certain place because you can't uniquely join contigs at a repetitive element. Um, but however, once you've ordered contigs into scaffolds, um, then you know that these contigs are next to each other due to the pair um, information. We have another algorithm um, called align contigs end to end. So I can, it's an aligner that will go through the scaffold and merge adjoining ends if there's some overlap. And that will usually close 10 to 20% of the contigs in my project just by looking to that overlap. It's a constrained aligner that only looks for overlap in adjoining contigs. So that, that's one additional tool. Um, I can also do other things, and if I go to this contig menu, and I, I won't go through obviously all these things, but um, there are additional um, uh, algorithms. I can align contigs. I can split contigs apart. I can make edits on them. I can also go and look at the ends of contigs. So if I double click on a contig, I'm now looking at the aligned data. Um, oftentimes I'll look at the ends here and see, you know, is there a problem on the ends of my contigs? Am I, do I have some linkers there that are poisoning the ends? Do I see lots of mismatch? I can do manual edits. I can trim back by grabbing these arrows and trimming. Or I can highlight a region like this and click delete. I won't do that in a scaffold right now. So I can make micro edits. 
um, to the actual sequences. I can make edits to the configs themselves. Um, oftentimes I'll do that before I create a scaffold if I think there's some places that need this editing. I can scroll through. You can see this content has fairly thin coverage, it's some kind of a repeat. So we can visualize, you know, look at that. Um, so I can go through and kind of make that assessment of the data. And oftentimes, if I see mismatches, so I'll go to a deeper contig here. You know, if I see, here's kind of an example of what a poison end might look like. If I see the single read extending off the end and then I see some mismatch, um, that's, that indicates a read that might be poisoned in the end. You know, I might decide to go back to my assembly, identify what the element is, and try to trim it out prior to assembly. So I always look at the ends. You'll pick up tags that are at the ends of contigs, um, and that visualization will allow me to make some further adjustments on the assembly. Uh, so that's how we create some scaffolds, um, do the visualizations. Uh, there's additional tools uh, now for things like gap closure and annotation. And gap closure and annotation tools, uh, as an example, I can lock down a project. So I'll just show you. Um, let's see here. So what this is doing, I put a little lock symbol in front of my contigs. If I'm going to start closing gaps, I could say I'm going to focus on the gap between contig 381 and contig 52. Um, using a variety of different methods, I can try to figure out what's in that gap. I might blast the edges surrounding the gap um, and, and identify it as an IS element. Um, when I do that, I can introduce new sequences. So I can add a potential splicing sequence into the project. I won't go through all these steps. And then I can click Assemble. I can either go to Contig Align Contigs or click the Assemble button. And that allows me to bring in potential splicing fragments to start doing gap closure steps. And there's different ways to produce those fragments. You may have designed PCR primers to get an amplicon sequence. You might blast and just pull out a piece from a reference genome. Um, so there, there's, there's a number of different ways to identify that piece and then use these alignment algorithms um, within SeqMan to align these contigs together and close gaps off. Of course, that's a very laborious process. You know, if, if you're doing gap closure and have an organism where you need gap closure done, um, you can talk with me um, you know, after the webinar and I can assist. We have some uh, more specialized documentation for doing that, that sort of gap closure work. Uh, we also have annotation tools. And so if I uh, have some consensus sequences and I want to annotate them, I think I have one here ready here. Let's see. And oh, I guess not. So I'll just, if I want to annotate a contig, what I can do is I can manually annotate, create a new consensus feature, or I can do some batch annotation work too. So I can highlight a region. And what we can do is we can blast this region and then pull in annotations that way. I'll just take a little piece like this. Hopefully there's... So I'm just going to blast this area. And we're getting close to lunchtime, so it'll probably be slow, but I can collect features then. So as I get blast hits back, I can collect features from that blast hit. And those features then will automatically annotate my consensus sequence. So I can go through the blast hits, find the strongest hits, add automatic GenBank style features to my contigs uh, using this kind of a, a blast approach. And it'll start to spool results here, though. But we won't wait for all these results to come in. But um, and so that's some of the annotation kind of work uh, that we can do as well. So here's here's just the blast window. And our BLAST window gives some great uh, information, like the query coverage. This means that 93% of what I BLASTed uh, matched the database, 99.9% of this particular E. coli, so this E. coli strain. So then I could go and collect the features from that strain. And so it just pulls these features in and creates a feature table. 
and then I can send the consensus out to other programs to see the annotations um, and start to bring in annotations in that, in that way. So that's kind of a, the, the de novo workflow. Let me just jump back here uh, to the PowerPoint. And so this particular data set where we did some adjustments, um, the default parameters match of 90, quality end trim of, of quality 10, window 5. Um, I tried a variety of different quality end trimmings, different quality scores with a window of 10, and then some different fixed end trimming parameters. And that's what I showed you in the engine uh, workflow. And the results then for this particular data set were actually quite different depending on how aggressively we trim the end. So just to give you an idea, but with default parameters, it didn't finish at all. Um, so we had to make some more drastic changes. And you can see here with different quality scores, um, quality scores of 15 and window of 5, quality of 15, window of 10. Um, we have differences in sizes of our contig and 50, and they are as small as 35. But when we use the quality 10 window, window 10, we can get up to a 133 kilobase um, contig and 50. If we are too aggressive, too high of a quality, we start to lose some of the contig size. Um, you can see largest contig likewise. It is small when we don't trim enough. There's too much poor quality data. It gets a, a, a peak size at what presumably is our best quality uh, trimming options. And then again, the contig size decreases as we over trim. And assembly times are also affected. So um, in a novel data set, the best you can do is a series of assemblies to see what gives you the best contig sizes. Uh, when you have the answer, um, we can do things like a mauve alignment and look for things like false joins in the assembly. Um, match percentages um, also have a big impact. Um, they're different for the different platforms. Um, higher for the more stringent platforms or the, with the lowest error rate, lower for platforms that have a higher error rate. Um, match percentage, percentage also has a profound impact. If I go too low, um, there might be too much low quality data that in, it's going to inhibit the assembly. And that's what happens with this particular data set. It gives me a 21 uh, hour assembly time, uh, lots of false joins. Um, if I'm too high with the match percentage, again, it inhibits the formation of larger contigs, although there's very few false joins. So there's a balance then with match percentage. I want to have very accurate contigs, but as large as possible, but I don't want large inaccurate contigs. And so match percentage, again, has this profound impact on um, my de novo assembly. And the th so the way that we confirm then, of course, if you have the answer, which we do with this E. coli set, we can use the mauve aligner out of the UW. And that mauve aligner can then take the contigs that I've formed de novo, align them back to a reference. And this is actually how we do our quality control to set our default parameters. And what we're looking at here is uh, the um, a list of contigs at the top, and the blocks represent the different colored blocks represent different contigs. The genome at the bottom, and if we look at this purple contig, we can see there's kind of hard to see these little red lines, but um, there's actually between the red lines is a contig, and you can see this is what a false join would look like. Is that we've got the two red lines that designate one contig, and then two different colored blocks. So we can go and uh, run different assemblies, and then check against the answer to see what that optimal balance is between large contigs and having uh, the possibility of false joins in those contigs. Um, so uh, that's all I plan to cover today. Uh, I hope that we have uh, lots of different questions. Um, it, you know, in summary, uh, the DNA Star software is, is really an excellent de novo assembler and gives us a large number of um, assembly parameters and analysis tools. Um, and when you're looking at uh, de novo assemblers, you really want to make sure that uh, first of all, that you can make adjustable parameters, and then you have a interface where you can visualize, look at contigs, look at scaffolds, make the micro and macro edits that you need. Um, uh, trimming off the poor quality data in de novo assemblies is absolutely essential. Um, and also like, the accuracy really becomes more important overall than the size of the contigs. And it's better to have more smaller, more accurate contigs that you can put into an accurate scaffold than have large contigs that potentially have uh, misjoins in them. Uh, again, our Seekman engine 
Um, our SeekMan software has both manual and auto annotation capability. Um, so if you are closing your genomes and annotating them, we can provide those sorts of tools as well. So with that, I uh, thank you for joining me this, uh, this morning or afternoon, depending on where you are, and I'd be more than happy to field some questions at this point. Yes, uh, please do chat in your questions now. Um, we do have one. Um, is there some kind of guide that DNA Star provides to um, helping set some of those advanced options? It looked like there were several in the dialogues that, that you showed in SeekMan Engine. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, the, so the help menu that's within SeekMan Engine um, provides uh, specific information as to what each parameter does. Um, I would always, the, the, what I would recommend though, is the first use default parameters. And if you're not happy with the results for whatever reason, send um, DNA Star, send our tech support your script file and your report file, and we can look at that and make some very quick recommendations as to what parameters you might want to change to improve the assembly. Um, and So that would be really the first thing that I would do uh, before I adjusted, started adjusting parameters. Great. Thank you. Uh, it looks like that's all the questions. Oh, just um, one just came in, and I can answer that, uh, is asking if this presentation will be available later. And the answer is yes, it will be on our webinars page. Um, Everyone who's attended here should get um, a link to that um, to that video when it's up. It's usually up within a day. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions, but feel free to to chat them in these last few minutes while I give um, some of the closing information. Um, in two weeks, we'll have another webinar featuring an overview of sequence alignment and gene discovery, and that'll be presented by Aaron Reynolds um, at the same time, and you can register for that also on our webinars page. Um, another question about tech support that just came in. Um, is there unlimited access to tech support, or is there a separate tech support package, or, or how does that work, Matt? So technical support, uh, if, if you're a new customer and you've purchased software, uh, the software is provided with a year-long service plan that provides you with software upgrades and technical support uh, for, for, for that one-year period. And, and the support will include you know, phone support, email support, and even webinar support where we can uh, help diagnose uh, the problem that you're having. Um, if you uh, do not have software or you've got expired software, to get technical support you would renew a service plan and that would give you another year of, of, of upgrades and, and tech support. Great. Thank you. Well, well, it looks like that's all the questions for now. Um, if you do have other questions, uh, please feel free to email us uh, at webinars at dnastar.com uh, or um, you know, visit our website. We've got uh, demo request forms there and technical support forms so you can request help that way. And I also want to mention in addition to the webinar recordings, we have uh, over 100 videos showing in-depth workflows, um, including some de novo genome assembly workflows. So if you want to see uh, more demonstrations of the software, please visit our webinar, or excuse me, our videos page at dnastar.com forward slash videos. So with that, I think we'll wrap up. Uh, thank you everyone for attending today, and we hope to see you at another webinar soon.